Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm New. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and poisoning cases from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 48. Ah, what a wonderful week. Week two of lockdown. How are you, Nick? I'm all right. Working from home. It's all very exciting. Is it? We did say we weren't going to talk about this because nothing is changing. Oh, no, that was on Patreon where the two of us were just, it was Monday, we were drinking heavily and just going, ah. But now it's kind of midweek and it's like, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're, and we're, the two of us are drinking heavily. Exactly. Um, but we're so. over hump day. It's fine. Right, okay. So much potential. But still, not much has changed. No, not much has changed. The death rates are rising. It's, uh, we're confined to our house forever. But, you know, it's probably fine as long as we have alcohol. Exactly. So. That's all one needs in these situations. Exactly. Any poisonings this week? No, 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 don't believe so. No, no, not in your general area. Not in my general area of where I can reach from my desk. So. <laughs> I'm being fancy calling it a desk. <laughs> in fact, my dining table. No poisonings in the house and no no hints of murders around you or anything or next door that you've had to investigate? Well, not in the, in the immediate vicinity. Oh, good. I mean, there is no one living in the house next door. Or perhaps they are dead and just very, very quiet. Oh, OK. That's fine. That's fine. They, they haven't found the body. It, yeah, so it could well be that many murders have taken place and quite successfully. <laughs> um, and you have just been sitting, swilling your brownie going, I hear nothing at all. <laughs> exactly. All is quiet. All is well with the world. I'm sure there's two sides to this. Speaking of poisonings and, uh, and people dying, some people we really hope don't die are our fabulous Patreon <laughs> subscribers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was weird. <laughs> I'm just trying new segues into that every yeah. week now. Because <laughs> that was a delight, that one. We hope you don't die. Exactly, we hope you don't die. And fuck off as well. <laughs> you sitting there judging. I don't hear you making up witty repartee on the dime. I, I don't hear this either. <laughs> um, <so. laughs> ooh, 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 ooh. This kitten's got claws. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite a good retort. Actually. Very witty. That was really very good. Very good. good. So, yeah. Well, um, shall we thank our Patreon subscribers? We should indeed. So thank you so much to the darling Maggie Reed. Thank you to Janelli Montez. And to Sarah Nugent. Thank you very much. You're all entirely delightful. Beautiful, sexy, sexy people. Sexy names this week. Those are all exotic, fun names. I like them. Yes, Maggie. 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 Sarah. <laughs> they're, they're strange and exotic names. I Okay. Well, the surnames are quite good. You've got Nugent. And... Yes, Excuse okay, yes. me for trying to bring a bit of mystery to their lives. They're lo- it's lockdown. Let's, let's just give them two seconds of happiness. Thank you so much for subscribing and enduring this abuse, apparently, that we told out yeah, indeed, over the airways. Absolutely. Probably not subscribing for long. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, Nick, are you ready to drink cocktails and talk about poison? I certainly am. I've, I've already had two glasses of wine, so that's probably where my lot of this is coming from. And I sense that has loosened your tongue. <laughs> well, we could... And we really could, Nick, drink poison and talk about cocktails. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You don't know what I put in your wine. This is true. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Well, unless you've snuck into my house and I haven't noticed in the past six weeks, then I think I'm okay. You know I could do it. This is true, you could. I could sneak into your house. I wouldn't do it quietly. That is also true. I could actually do it if I wanted to, but I'd fall over something and just go, oh, fuck, fuck, shit, shh, shh, I'm not here. But then you would go through the cupboard to make yourself a drink as well while you were here. Oh, yeah, totally. Um. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you've got all the good stuff. You've got the entire poisonous cabinet. I'm stuck with my pedestrian martinis and mezcals. (laughs) Yeah, that's what would happen. So I think we've concluded that we're going to go with the first one. Please so. Do the first one. We're going to drink cocktails and talk about poison and try to regain what is left of our tiny, tiny minds. (laughs) <laughs> I think it's the lockdown mood. I think everyone has just Something's lost weird. their minds. It's fine. <laughs> You're not allowed wine to start your episodes anymore. You're allowed a Negroni <laughs> when you have white wine. The cat claws come out. But that's what the people pay for, honestly. Well, exactly. You are paid to deal with this abuse. <laughs> well, actually, most of the people listening to this one, they're not paying. It's free. It's free <laughs> abuse. If you want Sinead to get more abuse, then join our Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's dark. <laughs> well, over there is just vile and vitriol. I'm very, I'm very nasty. <laughs> Patreon's more like kind of after hours crowded around that last whiskey at a darkened bar, just bitterly muttering about poisonings and the tales that we've heard. That's why Patreon's such a great place. And the few who are initiated, <laughs> they know it well. Well, it's your story, Nick. Yes. Hooray, hooray, hooray. But as we've established, we Indeed. can't possibly, can't, can't, can't 
hear a story without a cocktail in hand. Madness would be such a thing. It's insane, insane. Far worse than anything we've said today. As it's your story this week, you got to choose the secret ingredient that will flavour the cocktail and is inspired by the tale that we tell. And this week's secret ingredient is... Is wine. Wine? A lovely white wine. A white wine. A white wine. We yes. have not done a white wine. We've done red. We've done sparkling. And we've done fizz, but no white. Yes. Now, we, we, we love a martini, which is vermouth-based, which is a wine-based spirit. Is it? Is, is a vermouth a wine-based it, spirit, yes. isn't it? It is, yes. It's like a fortified thing. Yep. But having just white wine in a cocktail, ooh, that could be dangerous. Yet delicious. I'm intrigued. Well, hopefully, hopefully it is going to be delicious. We shall find out soon enough. Indeed. So with white wine as your inspiration, what have you come up with? I have made a very exciting white wine spritzer. <laughs> no, you fucking haven't. No, I haven't. No, I haven't, God. No. I lied. I swear to yes. God, I believed you. <laughs> I was like, I don't want that. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank the good Lord. No. I lied. I'm so funny. Um, <laughs> I have made okay. a left bank martini. Ooh. Oh, I like. I like. So yes. thinking left bank from Paris? I don't know in the slightest, to be honest. Isn't the left bank the, the, the kind of artistic or the, one of the beautiful areas of, of Paris? Well, potentially it, it, was, it was developed in London in the 2000s, um, <laughs> but I do not know what the inspiration behind the name. Perhaps on the left bank of the Thames. Oh, that's um, a good point. Or it could be that someone left a bank and needed a drink. There is that too. Yes. Or they could be meaning the left bank uh, of the Thames. Or perhaps they they left bank tube station and turned left. They, they did. They just walked around in a circle for ages around bank. So, who knows? <laughs> Depends wait, which direction you're facing. Well, exactly. Yes. Exactly. Okay, a left bank martini. I like this idea. I like the sound of it. And I'm intrigued. Nick has delivered me the special ingredients for this week's cocktail. So it's time for us to go into our isolation kitchens and shake up a storm. So we'll see you in a minute. I'll see you in a sec. And we're back. Hello. So a left bank, Nick. Mm, mm. Looks sophisticated. Looks very fancy. I did look up a uh, left bank uh, in the interim while mixing up the cocktail. And I was right. I was right. It is the left bank of Paris was where all the artists were. All the artists and the thinkers and the great philosophers in, you know, I suppose the Belle Epoque. And then a little later on, I'm not being a historian on this one. <laughs> but yes, the left bank. So an era of beauty and of art and of free thinking Quite. and of creativity. And now we have a cocktail to go with it. Well, indeed. So, so it looks very beautiful. It does indeed. It looks very sophisticated. <laughs> I'm not at all brown. Yes, because we've had a bad run, haven't we? Uh, have we had a bad run? A mediocre run, Me- which yes. is kind of, which is the worst kind of run. A questionable run haven't we really there's been a few yeah. relatively uninspiring drinks yeah they I were think. only okay so we got high hopes for this one well i'd say talk us through it but now you refuse to do that until i've tasted nope, it. none of that let us have a taste and see what we think so merry cheers. christmas merry cheers. christmas Ooh. i find that very pleasant that is incredibly pleasant that is very nice Ooh. indeed Oh, it's elegant. Oh, it's elegant. It's sophisticated. It's, I don't know. I don't know mm. what it wants me to do. It's nice. Mm. That's I like lovely. That. It's very good. So all I can get is the, definitely a, a martini flavour without any of the harshness that you, you sometimes will get with a, well, yeah, with a gin martini, I guess. And there's a little perfume to it. So, oh, I'm intrigued, Nick. Talk us through it. Well, we have the the basis of a martini. So we have gin and vermouth. Okay. We also have um, some white wine. White wine. As established um but then we also <laughs> have um elderflower really which is your perfumey aroma that you're getting is in fact elderflower yeah because i don't really hate elderflower yes i know you're not a fan of elderflower so i'm quite glad that you don't dislike this one mm. i mean there's half an ounce of elderflower it's quite a bit actually so i would be tempted to knock it down slightly because yeah. i find it quite noticeable and not unpleasant knock it down a, li- a wee little bit um but otherwise it's a really nice drink i think that's lovely i mean honestly i am not a massive fan of the elderflower um i don't mind it but i find it, it everyone puts elderflower in everything and i think there was a period maybe about a, two years ago where elderflower oh, it was, was everywhere bloody Absolutely. everywhere elderflower gin elderflower syrup in wine and champagne elderflower in your food and it's too perfumed it's a really strong flavor and it was overused much like lavender and so, yeah, normally I hate it. But that, honestly, I mean, you, you said knock it down a bit. Mm. I can, I just got a hint of the perfume, mm. but I can not, I'm not getting, ooh, elderflower. It's lovely. Excellent. It's smooth. Well, again, again, for this one, as I always do, I've had to buy a massive bottle of elderflower liqueur. 
<laughs> so expected in many future cocktails because there are a surprisingly large amount that do require a drop of elderflower um, and now i'm yeah. quite glad to have this in the cupboard now well this is good because elderflower has not come up as an ingredient yet and elderflower is technically poisonous indeed so elder is very witchy it's associated with witches and it can conversely be good luck or bad luck depending on which side you fall depending on what day it is of the week it is yeah i personally find elders elder trees and elder flower and elder bushes quite quite horrible so i remove them from my gardens before the berries can have a chance well, luckily, there's no actual elder tree in this cocktail. Oh, thank God. Um, nor is there one in the story. So we are safe on all fronts. Hooray. So with our left bank martinis firmly in hand, are you going to tell us the story, Nick? I am. I'm so very glad you picked up on the, the left bank, the left bank of the Seine, because we are, in fact, going to Paris Yay! for our story. So it's a hot summer night in August 1933. Ooh, I like it. I like it. Hot jazz out there on the, the left bank. Hot summer's night. <laughs> uh, Monsieur and Madame Mayou are sound asleep in bed in their apartment. Uh, number nine, Rue de Madagascar. Mm. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce French things in a French way because it will go very, very bad. Especially after some wine, it'll get very <laughs> insulting um, and turn into an episode of Hello, Hello. So it's probably best we don't do that. Uh, that's just in a Patreon episode that we'll follow up with. <laughs> <laughs> the nearby church bells have just chimed midnight um, when suddenly a scream rips through the building. Oh my God. A few seconds later, there is a mad pounding at the front door um, and the voice of a young woman cries out, Monsieur Mayo, wake up, come quick. Oh God. Now, Monsieur Mayo and his wife groggily wake up and stumble out of bed and by the time they have put their night jackets on and night jacket nightgown <laughs> and reach the apartment door the, <laughs> the 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 whole house is awake it's a big six-story townhouse lots of apartments lots of families so like a tenement in, building like a tenement building it's still a quite nice sort of middle mm. class sort of place um but oh, lots it's of paris please <laughs> lots of people living in this place so there's lots of people who have come out of their apartments into the stairwell what is this racket going on the concierge um of the building he is rushing up the stairs demanding to know what all this commotion is about. Oh, goodness. I love the scene setting here, actually. Oh, yeah, it's midnight good. in the streets of Paris. <laughs> so I love it. When Monsieur Mayo opens his front door, a young woman falls into his arms in <gasps> sobs. Um, she is a tall, dark-haired and beautiful. Is it Esmeralda? It's not. The hunchback has not struck again. <laughs> <laughs> Wearing a, a sparkling evening gown underneath a man's overcoat. Monsieur Mayo instantly recognises this woman as Violette Nozaire, um, the daughter of the couple who live in the apartment opposite. He tries to calm her down and find out what is going on. It's Mama and Papa, she cries. They're dead. The place is full of gas. Oh, Christ. And as soon as she has spoken these words, the sweet smell, of that sweet sickly smell of gas starts seeping out and it's quite obvious. Now, the concierge he gets a whiff of this and he has head straight downstairs to turn the gas off in the basement. And when he returns, he opens the front door to the Nozaire's apartment and he is hit by a wall of gas. Hey. All the gawkers and onlookers from the stairwell, they rush back to their own apartments and slam doors and start stuffing coats in the gaps to stop yeah. the gas coming into their own their own homes. The concierge, though, he's a brave chap. He clamps a handkerchief to his to his face yes that all encompassing good bit of armor absolutely there, a, handkerchief. a handkerchief will sort you out against anything and he rushes into the apartment he finds the gas on at the kitchen stove mm -hmm. um no flame obviously the gas just left on he quickly turns it all off and throws open all the windows in the apartment to get some air and try and clear the gas out in the hallway Violet is telling Monsieur and Madame Mayo and a few of the other nosy neighbours who have stuck around. <laughs> There's ten people. Absolutely. They're sort of peering. Exactly. Oh, they're dead, are they? Okay, please, let us yes, know. What What's going on? What's going on? <laughs> well, that's very dangerous as well, actually. They're just hanging around in a gas-filled apartment. <laughs> yeah, they're French. They've got their, they're there with my, their martini. They and... smoke liberally. It's <laughs> fine. Just... Their lungs are shot to shit. It's fine. Gas leak. I'll have a cigarette. It's fine. Exactly. We'll burn the shit away. <laughs> she has just come home after staying with a friend for a few days and as soon as she's opened the door she has smelt the gas she says she has called out to her parents but there is no answer oh. she she says she's run through the apartment and found her father's body lifeless on the bedroom floor her mother laying in the bed oh. next to him 
And this is exactly what the concierge has found. Um, Jean-Baptiste Nozier lying on the floor in his nightshirt beside the bed. Uh, one hand clutching the leg of the bed as if he had been trying to stand oh. but was too weak and wasn't able to hoist himself up. Oh, God. His wife, thin and frail, mm. lay in her nightgown on the bed, her hands neatly folded by her side as if she was expecting death. Ooh, intrigue. <laughs> An intrigue. What the fuck? During all this commotion, thankfully, someone has had the thought to call the authorities. And, hope, and so, yes. You would hope, and thankfully, someone has. And so the apartment is full of activity. There's a uniformed uh, gendarme uh, taking notes of Violet's account in the hallway, finding out what's, what's happened, getting her statement. I mean, she says she's, she's not been staying home much of late. And she knows of no reason that her parents would do such a thing. So she is instantly leapt to the assumption of suicide. Yeah, because it seems like she's laying on the bed, that the, the husband and her have had a conversation. He's lit yep. the, He's gone and lit the gas, come back and tried to hoist himself onto the bed and didn't quite make it. Sold it, cracked it. There we are. Sorted, sorted. Yeah. So that she knows of no reasons for her parents' apparent suicide. Possibly money worry, she thinks, maybe, but huh, who knows. Mm-hmm. Violet is led away by a concerned neighbour down the stories of the, of the building. Um, she doesn't want this, this young woman to see the bodies of her parents stretched out of the apartment. You can imagine in a, an apartment building, everyone would be getting in on it, wouldn't they? Be like, oh Absolutely. no, come to my house and have tea. Tell me everything you know. <laughs> <laughs> so the body of Monsieur Nuzer is covered and taken out of a stretcher. Now medics are just about to draw a sheet over the face of Madame Nazaire when one of them shouts, quick, get me a mirror. No. A gendarme <gasps> quickly grabs one from the nightstand and holds it under her nose and to everyone's amazement, there is the faintest sign of breath She's alive. on this on this mirror. And a cry went out throughout the building. She's still alive. <gasps> Oh, I'm, I'm fully like hand to mouth I was, I was not expecting that oh my god what a twist <laughs> uh, she is rushed to the nearby hospital of, of St. Anton it is touch and go the doctors work throughout the night she is in a coma uh, she's in critical condition but she is hanging in there good for her you hang in there you <laughs> you hang in there now while the doctors are working to save uh, Madame Nozaire at the hospital assistant police chief Gaston Moser uh, arrives at the flat um, to start his investigation, what is going on? At first, the case seems straightforward-ish to him. Is he wearing like a, a mat and he's walking around with his hands in his pocket with his trilby on, like and just smoking? Ah, he's, he's, we... he's, he's, exactly. Yeah. He's got a Galois pipe as well at the yes, same time. At the, at the same time, <laughs> <laughs> he's smoking a pipe and a cigar and a cigarette. <laughs> ah, we the old ones. They always try to get past me. <laughs> Ah, mon dieu. He reasons that for for some reason, the couple have chosen to turn the gas on and lie down to die. So sad. They think then perhaps perhaps Monsieur Nozier has had then had a change of heart at the last minute and he has tried to get back to the kitchen to turn off the gas, but he is overcome by oh. the fumes, too weak, and he has fallen to the bedroom Sweet. floor. Now, none of the neighbours can offer any insight as to why the Nazaires would have wanted to commit suicide, um, despite Violet's mentioning that her parents have been in financial troubles and no one else was aware of any money worries. Neither were there any health issues that anyone was aware of. The police actually found bank books in the house that show that the Nazaires were quite comfortably off. Monsieur Nazaire had a good salary, he was a train engineer, and they lived very modestly. The only possible thing that a number of neighbours could point to was the stress and upset that had been caused by the scandalous goings on <gasps> of their wayward daughter. No, no. Who had left home a few months before, declaring that she was going to live life on her own. She was gone. She's she's eighteen years old, but she's Ooh. she's unmarried. And the moment you mentioned her turning up. In a sparkly dress under a man's coat at midnight, I was like, this is a woman who knows the ways of the night, Indeed. who is not shy of a party and is coming home to her <laughs> dear, good, honest parents. And if she's wandering around kind of going, I think they have many problems. I don't know. I'm just doing her voice like that. You know, it translate it from French. And it would do, yeah, like you, yeah. So next time do that in French. Oh, je ne sais pas, I'm a man, I'm a man, I'm a belle. L'argent, c'est très difficile. 
Seamless, mate. Seamless. It's, I mean, it's perfect. I mean, I thought I was in France. But she, I mean, she is nowhere to be found. The chief wants to question her. Um, she was last seen being taken down the stairs moments before that they found that her mother was still alive. Now, the, the gendarme had assumed that she would be staying with neighbours um, and that she would be easy to find. Why would she go and hide yeah, somewhere? Yeah, yeah. So he yeah. had not taken any name of or address or anything about where she would be staying and none of the other other residents knew where she had gone to but they were quite sure that none of her friends were local to this very respectable and middle class mm. area mm. that they lived the chief thought oh well she'll turn up in the morning i mean he was more concerned that she didn't know that her mother was alive yeah what did she do did she just she go was... in and just go to they're dead and then just walk out well i mean there, there was gas so she couldn't the, the, whole, the whole place was full of gas so she couldn't stay there and pretend to examine no. so she smelt the gas saw her parents ran out to get help but she said they were dead she said they were dead and she she didn't she, say she was help convinced me. they were dead banging on the door she wanted help she was going they're dead yeah she yeah she i, I can't imagine in a gas-filled apartment she had stopped to check for a pulse D- um, true true that true that i mean i, I mean i'm le- leaning on the side of if there's a gas-filled apartment and you see your parents passed out you'll be going help me they might still be alive go save them rather than they're dead let's move on maybe she was just knocking on the door to go by the way my parents are dead let's organize the funeral but there was one thing in the apartment building that was puzzling chief mazer the kitchen table still had the remains of an evening meal um complete with half drunk glasses of wine white wine wine. you say yes lovely lovely glasses half mean half drunk absolutely madness madness. they had to have killed themselves if they just went we can't finish this wine it's time to end our lives but puzzling thing the table set for three what the fuck no what it what who was this third diner i mean it was possible that the nazares had made their suicide pact over dinner didn't clear the table um and got straight to it what, what, but who was this third person was the third party we don't know did they bring the wine <laughs> was it that bad now, a dinner party was it just one of those dinner parties where someone came around and went it yeah, sure you f- the fish was fine it was all right <laughs> and then they left go, well we have to kill ourselves now we can never face society again now no one had seen anyone else in the building on that day Con- the concierge confirmed he had been sitting out front until about 10 in the evening um, and he was sure that the only people who he had seen were other residents of the building. There were no guests or anything like that. Violet hadn't been there herself before the 12 o'clock discovery. Mm. So there was no... Who was this third person? Yeah. No one knew. I love a, a mystery <laughs> setting, place setting. <laughs> I love the idea of like, there was, but there was a third party there at was a dinner. Third, yes. <laughs> oh my God, I love this story so much. <laughs> and they had white wine with dinner. It was, was it good wine, at least? I do not know the exact variety of the wine. God damn it. <laughs> also, Monsieur Mayor, the, the neighbour, I mean, he has said they, they did not hear a peep from the Nazaire's apartment all evening i mean certainly not the perhaps the the joyful chattering noises you would expect of having a merry dinner with Hmm. friends Hmm. no one it was as silent as anything i mean in fact no one had seen the desires at all that day but this would all be cleared up shortly violet would be back at any moment and if madame nazaire pulled through and woke up she would be able to tell anyone exactly exactly what is going on but by the morning everything had been thrown into chaos and turmoil a report has arrived from the doctors at saint anton hospital madame nazaire is still in critical condition Mm. uh, but she was not as everyone had suspected suffering from the effects of inhaling gas what instead they had discovered that madame nazaire had taken or been given a huge dose of verneral no which was a local brand name for a for the sleeping drug barbitual Barbitual. yes oh my god (laughs) mind blown oh she was (laughs) and she was lying peacefully she'd take it oh my god turns out the amount of gas she inhaled was negligible she had already been drugged by the time 
the gas had started to flow and she was inhaling it. Oh, no, she was no. lying in bed out of it as the gas started oh, to flow. Evil. On this discovery, they immediately order an autopsy of Monsieur Nazaire. Yeah. And sure enough, they discover that he has also died from a massive dose of Verneral. Shit. Now, this apparent suicide pact is looking more and more suspicious and more and more sinister as it goes. Yeah, I guess... I, I'm sure it's not going to go this way, but a very macabre version of it would be is you take the drugs and then turn on the gas and then sit in the bath with the toaster to make sure it's going to happen. I'm basing this mostly on the film Delicatessen, which I think I have referenced in this podcast <laughs> before. <laughs> I'm thinking that wasn't the case. They weren't just being extra safe. The the, the police are taking a more suspicious view <laughs> of, of things. Fully have an eyebrow raised. They have at least one eyebrow raised. Oh, yeah. Possibly two, maybe even a third. <laughs> getting quite it's getting quite curious at the police station it's getting quite weird as well <laughs> <laughs> now with this new development the case is handed over to the surette nationale the the national french police Ooh, that um, is big. who have a lot more experience with these really serious crimes than the the local gendarme the investigation is taken over by inspector marcel guilliam Oh, good, yeah, good um, name, good name. He is famous across France, Okay, um, this detective. And he is actually the inspiration for Inspector Magray. He, he no, was he the, isn't, really? Yes, he, he, but apparently he knew the author. The, the author of Inspector Magray, I don't know his name, was a, was a friend of the inspector and the inspector was the inspiration for the fictional detective. Oh, go watch that afterwards, you'll enjoy it. <laughs> Now, the inspector urgently wants to talk to, to Violet. Um, she is still not turned up. With the new hmm. theory of murder, the for forensic technicians are sent to the apartment and they go through everything in minute detail. In two of the wine glasses on the table, they find traces of Verneral, this sleeping drug. Fingerprints on the third glass are too smudged to get a proper print and for an identification. Really? heard of that before it's but it's convenient isn't it oh very oh, very 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 very, very convenient. convenient though in a waste paper basket they find a note from a dr duron instructing monsieur madame nazaire to take the powders enclosed what what so the note they find from the doctor wait a minute so the doctors okay so the doctors prescribed them the barbiturates some some powders so, so, we don't know some powders it would have been obviously a, a little parcel that had this prescription enclosed in take, it so take these saying, powders take the for they are my blood <laughs> in a dresser drawer they find a stack of passionate love letters addressed to violet what? they are all from a trap called louis pierre um, <laughs> could he be have more of a french name so <laughs> absolutely louis pierre, pierre le uh, fleur de fleur <laughs> Sorry, any French listeners. The most recent ones speak of marriage, their devotion to each other, and are very, very passionate. Marriage to her, not just speak of marriage. Just generally. About, yes, but between, no, between Violet and He didn't and just Louis write, Pierre. I love you, and here is a dictionary definition of marriage. I love you, and I'm getting married to Doris. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> I thought you should know. Doris, that classic French name. Um, <laughs> Maybe that's why she was so enraged. <laughs> because <laughs> i'm still pinning it on her at this point but i don't i don't know i'm my mind is blown <laughs> everyone is a suspect right now the doctor was sending the powders someone was writing her love letters the dictionary right dr johnson was writing her love letters oh god it's a roller coaster carry on oh thank you um first they go to see dr duron he is a respectable well-known doctor um and when he is interviewed he claims the note to be a complete forgery Nothing like my signature, nothing like my handwriting. Nice. Um, I have never met the Nazaires before. No. But mm, mm, mm. I have been treating their daughter for anemia. No. Oh, the bitch. Next, they take a trip to visit Louis Pierre. He has a small studio apartment in the Latin Quarter. Which is the, which is the left bank. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the, the concierge tells the inspector that, uh, that Pierre is a law student, but he is well in with the big art crowd he has a reputation as a wild party animal as we would say probably but he probably didn't use that word <laughs> not that phrase but he's on the scene he's there partying with the with the best of them one of the uh, the beautiful people i suppose he also has a very flashy beautiful new <gasps> girlfriend who has been staying quite a lot <gasps> recently naughty which we under we get from the from the letters <laughs> now 
the inspector and his task force, his subordinates, visit all the nearby cafes and restaurants and clubs and things <laughs> and question anyone they come across. And they find a young woman named Madeleine Debiz, who said she is Violet's closest friend. Ooh. She, does, she doesn't know where Violet is now, but on last she is able to provide her with an alibi for that Monday evening. The, the night that her parents have, have oh. died. Violet and I were at a party, she says, with some student friends last night. We had dinner at about five and a little brasserie up the street. And then we went dancing at the Bal Tabrin. We were tired and we left the party early, about 11 o'clock. And Violet said she thought she'd go home to her parents for the night. Mm -hmm. That all tied in very nicely with her then arriving around midnight at her parents' apartment and discovering that. But she has got an absolute alibi now for her movements throughout that evening. It sounds completely plausible. Also, can I just say, God, that sounds nice right about now. <laughs> just go out, just a little dinner, then a little dancing, little a few drinks, then go and see your parents, <laughs> then just go to your family. Oh, oh, put on a dress and go and dance. Sorry, I might be getting more emotionally involved in this story than I normally would. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm slightly leaning towards whatever she did was fine. She got to see people. I don't. Care. Madeline is able to fill them in on Violet's moving movements early that day as well. Um, she had lunch with a young artist in a cafe on the Boulevard Houseman, and then spent most of the afternoon riding round the cafes of the quarter with two Egyptian students in their new car. Oh, can she can just fuck off? Quite frankly, right it's, now she's it's, showing it's off. Quite, she really is. She is living quite the life. She's not of the, though. The sort of. It girl. She's just saying that to all of the police, like we do on Instagram. <laughs> oh my God, living my best life. She was at home in her shitty pajamas, eating just mayonnaise with a spoon. That's that's you. That's that's. <laughs> yeah. mm, mm. But I, I will put my prejudices aside for a minute. <laughs> Back in the Nazaire's apartment block, uh, Inspector Gilliam and his colleagues are finding a slightly different view of young Violet. The, the residents there can't provide any clue to where she is, but they have plenty to say about her past. Her parents just couldn't seem to control her, one woman says. She, is, she was always in trouble at school. Since the age of 12 or 13, she's been running around with one man or another. She simply became attractive to men too soon, and it turned her head, they said. That's bit... Okay, fine. They say they, they tell that Violet has left home several times in the past, but has always come back. She was constantly arguing with her long-suffering parents, asserting her right to live on her own, to do her own thing, but then constantly returning to them for handouts and for money. Teenagers. <laughs> Teenagers. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. I can live my own life. Please, can I have money to do it? <laughs> exactly. Monsieur Mayo <laughs> provides, the neighbour provides a slightly more sinister interpretation. This wasn't the first time that there have, there have been suspicious happenings in the Nazaire apartment. Only two months previously, the Nazaires had again almost been overcome by a leaking gas jet. What? Another time, their bedroom window curtains mysteriously caught fire. And th Ow. three or four times they were racked with terrible, terrible pains after eating um, and had to had called Monsieur Mayo to send for a doctor. And none of these things were explained. They were just things that had happened. Sweet Jesus. Investigations show that Monsieur Nazaire had about 180,000 francs in the bank. Oh. It's a considerable sum of money, which would have first go to his wife and then to Violet in the event of his death. Now, in the middle of the investigation, Louis-Pierre comes back to Paris. He finds out from his, the concierge of his building that the police have been looking for him. And he voluntarily goes and says, right, I'm Louis-Pierre. I hear you're looking for me. What's up? He, he says that he and Violet have been friends for about a year. But when her parents found his letters to her, um, they forbade her from seeing him at all. Okay. When this happened, he then promised marriage to Violet and she promptly leaves home and moves into his studio so obviously I mean he's a he's a law student he's from a fairly fairly well-to-do family so what objections mm -hmm. the Nazaires have against 
this match i don't know um but they seem to be yeah, quite against it mm, but perhaps he has a bit of a reputation a bit of a playboy a bit of a man about town type thing he does sound like he's a law student from a very rich family yeah. who is living up in paris and living in a studio and shagging all the birds and drinking all the wine which is absolutely fine but um, maybe not yeah, an appropriate husband their, for their yeah. for their darling not daughter not an appropriate husband yeah perhaps this has caused her to leave home for the final time and move into the studio now, when pressed about how Violet was supposed to be supporting her party lifestyle, Pierre admits that Violet has been getting money from other men. Oh, what? Oh, come on. So, oh, Violet. Yes, indeed. So there is no definitive thing that says, yes, she's a prostitute or anything like that. Or is she just providing a I'll go to dinner with you type of service thing or if it's escort escort type thing but she is getting money from older gentlemen which is helping fund her lifestyle it's also actually helping fund his lifestyle as well um and she is supporting him yeah that's quite shitty sex workers work no judgment on that whatever happens happens if you want to support yourself you do what you want but if it's a little bit of selling her out that she's shagging other men and it's supporting him oh that's yeah it would seem, mm. he, his, this, this all seems quite horrible his his parents look upon his current lifestyle very unfavorably and they have reduced his sort of allowance considerably so to top it up um violet is supporting them them both what the fuck is he doing why isn't he out having sex with other men or women well, perhaps he wasn't just not getting paid for it i don't know um <laughs> oh, maybe yeah, yeah yeah he was just doing it for pleasure yeah but you need to be paid for it oh for god's sake but when he is questioned about where is she now he claims he does not know um i haven't seen her since last week he says i don't know where she is but he said she mentioned a funny thing in a letter the other day she said she had inherited some money she was going to buy a car and come and get me the hunt oh. for violet nazaire becomes the main focus for the national police but when they put the timeline together it just doesn't fit they have hmm. a dozen witnesses saying that violet is partying in the latin quarter all afternoon all evening on that monday she couldn't possibly have been in the palm in the apartment been that third diner um, at the table and then to drug and gas her parents as well it just doesn't yeah. work she's got a perfect alibi the last time she was seen with her parents was in fact the sunday um when she had visited for lunch and then after that she is seen drinking and dancing in montmartre until dawn um on yeah. the on the sunday it looks like she i mean she has to be in the clear i mean nevertheless the inspector still wants to talk to her if only to let her know that her mother is still alive and there is a chance she's going to get better but the next morning comes news from the hospital that breaks the case wide open. Madame Nazaire has woken from her coma. <gasps> she is conscious. She is talking. And the first words she utters when she is able to talk and she has learned that her husband is dead is to point the finger straight at Violet. Their own uh... daughter has poisoned them. She had administered <laughs> the Ronal under the guise of powders prescribed by Dr. Duron for headaches. Madame de Zaire is also able to sort out the riddle of the timing. The poisoning, mm. in fact, had taken place on the Sunday afternoon when Violet had come by for lunch and not oh, that one. on the Monday, as everyone had assumed. As they had been eating their Sunday lunch together, um, both yeah. her, her and her husband had been overcome with nausea. And on the, the insistence of their daughter, they, were, they went straight to bed. They didn't even finish their meal. You need to go and lie down. You need to go and rest. Now, while Violet supposedly goes and rings the doctor for advice, minutes later she returns with two glasses, saying the doctor has said to take bicarbonate to settle your stomachs. <laughs> she gives them these two glasses with a white powder floating in the water. Oh, that's cold. They are, I mean, the elderly couple are actually quite taken aback by the new sort of slightly caring attitude of their daughter who has only ever been there when she wants something now she's there looking after them so they gladly take and drink back this bicarbonate given to them by their their daughter within moments really they are out cold and it all falls into place 
she has drugged her parents Sunday afternoon and left them to die. Now, while her parents lay dying, she goes out partying in Montmartre with the money she has taken from the apartment. Then, after establishing her alibi for Monday night, she comes back at midnight, turns on the gas and <gasps> to make it look like she, it has just happened and rushes out into the hall screaming. Oh, clever girl. That girl has the cunning of a devil, says Inspector Guillaume. <laughs> But they still don't know where she is. She's still missing. Yeah, where is she? That is clever. Do it on the sun. It, that is more Agatha Christie than we've seen. Oh, absolutely. Do it on the sun. Everyone thinks the dinner was on the Monday. Yeah. And they'd had not. something and they'd gone to bed. But Sunday it happened it and she came back and on down the s- on the gas. Yep. Oh, oh, what a bitch. But they still don't know where she is. Her picture is now in every paper in the country. Her name is on every radio station. There is a nationwide hunt for this cold-blooded yeah. woman who would kill her own parents. When Madame Nazaire is allowed back into her apartment, she finds that 3,000 francs that had been in the dresser ready to go to the bank was missing. Also, 1,000 francs that she had hidden amongst her dresses is also gone. It is now clear to the police how Violet has enjoyed such an extravagant few days. Oh, yeah. On August 29th, about 10 days after the murder, um, Count Henry Dubeck, nice. a young engineer, reports to the police he has made a date for that night with a lovely young woman who calls herself Christiane Daffay. He is sure that this is the elusive Violet. Her picture has been in all the papers and he has recognised her. When the woman turns up for their date, a squad of detectives... Is hiding behind a shrub and they pounce. <laughs> they're not behind a shrub, are they? They're not there, but they're there. They're concealed <laughs> nearby. She they rocks just up. wandered up holding a small sprig of holly. Yes. And just Hello. shuffling into the cafe. <laughs> <laughs> it's her. It's her. Pounce. And they make their arrest. Ooh. Now, the public feeling is so strong about this that a mob tries to storm the Petit Rocket prison where Violet is being held. And she has to be removed under heavy guard for her own protection. Bloody hell. Because the sentiment is so high. Now, under questioning by the inspector, Violet freely admits to poisoning her parents. <gasps> really? Yes. She claims that she is only meant to kill her father and gave less of the poison to her mother, which perhaps bears out because her mother did survive. But she claims that her father had assaulted her and that, in fact, she was pregnant by him. Uh. Now, an examination Mm. disproved this pregnancy entirely. She was Mm. not pregnant at all. And the inspector was able to prove that any assault did not take place. Well, not at the time and place that she said it did. He was able to disprove that. But this is, this is the reason that she came up with, to try and cast her father in such a, a terrible light. Actually, in fact, mm. her own mother takes out a civil lawsuit against her for slander of the dead. Because really? she has made these claims against her father. You, um, you can't actually do that, but still, good luck. She tried. It sounds like she's a complete and utter fantasist and she's been making lies up left, right and centre. And is this seems like a desperate attempt to go, I'm A, I'm pregnant, pregnant, the old pregnant thing. And then daddy did it and you can't blame me because daddy's a bastard. And obviously if it's disproven, she's just desperate. Oh, indeed. If you look at probably the, the photograph of her we will use for this patron episode is her actually photographed the night she was arrested wearing clothes that she had bought with the the money from her parents apartments and i mean she does look she looks incredibly chic she's there she's got a long black coat on with big black fur collar she's got a beret Mm. going on very french very sophisticated all freshly bought with the money she had stolen from the apartment so it doesn't seem like the actions of someone who has just been physically assaulted indeed not no absolutely not more than a year passes before the police Mm. investigation is complete and they Mm, are happy to go to trial Now, during this time, she has been annihilated in the press, absolutely torn to pieces. She is now seen as this scarlet woman, this middle class prostitute, this habitual liar. She is torn, torn to pieces, torn to shreds in in the press. She is never going to receive a fair trial. Mm, Fair enough. (laughs) But it, it takes the jury minutes to decide that Violette Nazaire is guilty. The judge sentences her to die on the guillotine. <gasps> she's, oh, she's not. 
She's not. Is she the last? No. No, she's, she's not, not the last. Oh. Uh, no no woman had been executed in France since 1887. And it had become standard practice that if they were given the death penalty, it would be automatically commuted to life. And there was actually a in- slightly interesting side note, actually, as to why okay. no women have been sentenced to death since 1887. In 1887, there was quite a famous case where Jeanine Thomas and her husband um, had been convicted for killing Jean's mother um, mm-hmm. and burning her body in a fireplace. Now, they were sentenced yet to, the, to be beheaded, but uh, Janine collapsed in hysterics on the scaffold um, and made <laughs> such a scene and such a um, furore that everyone watching was just like, we don't need to see this anymore. Fuck that. <laughs> so then from then on, no women were executed because of this potential spectacle that they would cause when they were going to their execution i mean doesn't matter because that, that was just a that was a thing that women did women women will go mental obviously. they'll just go mad men, they'll, they'll be fine men will be fine they'll do it with dignity women they'll just go nuts they'll cry they'll scream they'll shout people don't want to see that i mean you could have done it behind closed doors if you had to do it didn't have to be in front of every but that was the thing bloody was public, thousand people. public executions yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. anyway so that's that's why she wasn't executed but she only serves 12 years in prison in 1945 she is freed now, 1945, now I suppose French authorities have a bit more to, to worry about after the Second World War. Well, it's ended. They're fine. <laughs> <laughs> I think they had a bit to, bit to contend with after that. Yeah, well, before that and afterward, it wasn't, it wasn't plain sailing. No, indeed not. She goes and she lives for a further 20 years. Um, she eventually <laughs> marries. She has five children of her own. And in fact, by the end of her life, she is a devout Christian. She is a respectable woman. Um, She is beloved by her family and her neighbours and people in the town. Um, Possibly most surprising is that her mother actually ends up living with Violet and her new husband. What? And outlives her notorious daughter by several years. Was that what she wanted to do the whole time? (laughs) Was just watch her daughter die? I outlived you, you bitch. (laughs) But maybe so. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah. But obviously, some sort of reconciliation was had there. So that is the story of Violet Nazaire, who killed her father and tried to kill her mother for the cash Yay! and the fancy hats it would afford her. <laughs> Great story. Oh, that was that was edge of the seat stuff. Actually, I was just listening to all of that. Like, what? Yeah, mother went to live with her in the end. Indeed. God, that's weird. God, that's weird. And it's, everything it's that she had done. It's one of those things. Because there was another account that the the Inspector Guillaume Chappie, years later, he wrote his memoirs. Mm. Years and years later. And he referenced this particular case in his, in his writings. Um, and he was known as a, a very shrewd judge of character. He, mm. he knew people. And he actually suspected that what she had said about her father may have been true. Hmm... And then, so it does potentially make you think, well, perhaps did the mother know it was true? And if she was happy to go and live with her daughter who had done this thing and quite happy, openly admitted to have having done this thing. So there is something that weird there that might be... Yeah, that I mean, it is food for thought, isn't it? As, Potent, as too... Potentially possible. I mean, I don't know if we can say that it justifies murder. No, I don't... I, nothing, nothing justifies nothing murder. Nothing justifies that, but obviously... But as we've always it, said, you know, nothing justifies murder. There's there's many schools of thought you can go down. The most obvious two are that if she if she was molested, if she had been molested by her father, she would be acting out. She would be being an absolute terror to her parents and going off and trying to forge her own ways and escaping their control or escaping her father's control if that had all been going on. Then killed them to take the money. That it explains some of the sociopathic psychopathic behaviour if you've been subjected to that. There's also the other school of thought where she claims oh, she perhaps she was just a party girl and, and she just loved her loved her life yeah. she wasn't wasn't ashamed of her lying and getting what she doing what she needed to get her get the money to do what she wanted she Completely was having a great possible time. that she was just a petulant teenager who was off going off and living the wild life and yeah and was just annoying their parents and she made up lies and she made up whatever excuse it was to, i mean if she tried to kill them if god the father story makes more sense but if she was just trying to kill them repeatedly because she wanted the money and she wanted to go off and live with her boyfriends. I mean, it's horrible. It's really, really grim and dire. I mean, you, I mean even for for whatever reason she did it, the calculation and the planning mm. 
of the the alibis yeah. and uh, I'll do it on the Sunday, but I'll find them on the Monday, and I've got my alibi set up. I mean, that requires a that some serious thinking and serious smarts to get to get that worked out. If she's if she's thought that through that methodically, and there has been evidence of stuff beforehand, and the rest of her life she goes off and lives apparently a blameless life. Maybe you know, you know people can repent, mm-hmm. people can reform. But it does give a slight hint of a of, of a psychopath and a sociopath, really, if that's happening. It's it's an odd one, really. It's a curious one. It's, uh, sometimes you th- you feel slightly sympathetic, yeah. and then sometimes you go, "No, she's just nuts." Well, everything that all the evidence in that, aside from that allegation, was that she was nuts and that she was quite the bitch. I mean, the boyfriend and, you know, making the judgments earlier on saying like, oh, she went and did sex work, but he didn't. You know, maybe he had no idea. Maybe she was just off being a fancy woman and she was just getting cash off whoever was around. Maybe it wasn't a particular arrangement or anything he didn't know. But yeah, she was waiting to get the cash off mummy and daddy because she wanted to live the high life and lives were expendable. God, it's weird. Ooh, 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 creepy. And also to claim you're pregnant. When you're not pregnant. Oh, yeah, that, that, yeah. Well, you're very obviously not. And that can be easily tested and verified. I'd, you know what? We could spend hours going over why the mother went to live with her daughter later on. Well, indeed, Maybe yeah. they did forgive each other and she was reformed. And 20 years later, she was like, yeah, mummy, come and live with me. Look, I've got five kids. They're still alive. Look, I've proven myself. I haven't killed any of them. It's fine. <laughs> oh, that is a good story. Feels like a film one as well. Oh, we need to adapt that. Let's let's write a script and write a play based around it. <laughs> I love it. What do you think, guys? What do you think of this case? Do you think, you know, are you siding with Crazy Bitch? Are you siding with there was more going on here? Why else would you do stuff? Um, have you ever left the gas on accidentally and worried if you would be <laughs> accused of poison? Because gas is horrible. Have you ever set your bedroom curtains alight? <laughs> Send us your theories and your thoughts. And the left bank martini, absolutely delicious. That broke the bad run, yep. the mediocre run, I should say. It, it, it definitely did. Yeah, and that was most welcome because it was really lovely. That went down an absolute treat. It's another one that, yes, you may need to get some elderflower liqueur, but there's a lot of cocktails, as Nick has said with elderflower in it and also you can use that for many many things just put it in your water right. <laughs> it's an option it's an option but the recipe will be out on friday um so let us know what you think if you haven't already come and join us over on patreon where there are loads of extra episodes lots of extra free material and you can come and have a chat with us and tell us what you'd like to hear from us on patreon we're doing a little survey at the moment uh check out our merch store if you haven't already if you need some mugs or if you need some stickers or some hoodies if you're anything like me during lockdown you're just buying shit for no reason may as well buy some poisonous cabinet shit while you're doing it absolutely it's very therapeutic i highly recommend it quite right yes thanks for listening guys we have been the people inside the poisoners cabinet we will see you next week and remember Your loved ones are trying to kill you.